Hello, everyone. Welcome on into Clay Share Con, the afternoon of day one. And we have a really great tutorial lined up for you. We have Kathy Skaggs coming back again, joining us, and she's going to teach you some low tech silk screens. So, if you saw this morning's broadcast, you saw some printmaking with Amico velvet underglazes. Well, she's going to give you a low tech option. And I have some of my test plates so showing some of my favorite Amico velvet underglazes right here. So these are really great. I'd mentioned them already once with other companies under glazes, but these are a good resource to make for yourself to use with your favorite clear glaze so that you have these available to reference when you're working on any project, no matter what it is in ceramics. So keep this in mind when you're thinking about the velvet under glazes. All right, let's go on over to Kathy and see what she's got in store for us this afternoon. This afternoon. Hey, hey Kathy. Kathy. Hey there, Jess. Everything looks so great. Man, and you're so organized. I'm loving those plates. Holy <laughs> cow. <Thank you. laughs> I agree. Uh, my name is Kathy Skaggs. I work with, um, I work at Amico part-time. I'm mostly in my studio. And my job with Amico is to use products. And I mostly teach teachers how to use products in their classroom. As, but I also teach artists, so this should relate to you whether you're an instructor or you're in the studio, whichever. So um, if you have any questions, Diana, the magnificent Ferris, is also online, and she's in the Facebook part, I think, answering questions. And um, if you have a question for me, you can ask it through her, or you can email me later at clayopatra at gmail.com, clayopatra at gmail.com. And I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. So what we're doing today is we're, this morning we used uh, a product called EZ Screen. It's a light sensitive emulsion that's on a screen. And let me grab one. It looks like this, and that's what we did this morning. And it works great, and I do love it, but it is a little expensive, and there's lots of other options that you can use, different ways that you can do to create a print, and that's what we're going to talk about now. We are going to be using um, velvet underglazes. These, they're fabulous, and they're fabulous because you can thin them down and put them on like watercolor. You can thicken them up like I'm gonna show you in a minute to make it into a printing um, material or printing ink kind of was what I call it. Uh, you can use it right out of the jar, of course. It goes on um, moist clay, bone dry clay, leather hard clay, bisque clay, it does it all. It's a great, great product. The colors are also tinted to look like what they're going to look like after they're fired. So I even mix them like paints. I use a palette knife a lot and a glass palette sometimes to mix my colors. And I think they're really beautiful when they're combined a little bit. And uh, that just adds a little bit of complexity. So that being said, I'm going to switch my camera over my work area and I'm going to show you what I've got here for you today. Okay, this is how I prep the inks. I take a pint of teacher's palette, um, excuse me, what am I saying? Holy cow, uh, velvet under glaze, and I pour it into a pie pan. And I let it evaporate out until it just basically thickens up. So it's like this. I want it the consistency of like a, a, a face cream type consistency or a pudding consistency. And um, I find that that works the best. You don't want it too runny. Um, you do, I do come out in the morning or every day when I'm in the studio and I mix it, it will build a little bit of a skin. And so you wanna kind of mix that in every day and um, you just let it sit out. I didn't think this was enough and I ordered silk screen medium. I ordered a block printing medium. I even got gelatin from the grocery store. Anything that I thought could thicken it up uh, to see if that would work well. But what I found is you don't need anything. You can just let it stiffen up. Sometimes in my in our busy lives, this can happen where, uh-oh, dried a little too much. 
it is it does kind of reliquify so you do have to kind of restir it because you can see that it was kind of looked really thick but this is kind of the consistency that i like it i know that if i turn the knife over and the clay doesn't drop the underglaze doesn't drop off it's perfect but if it does get like it has gotten a little crispy around there because i didn't kind of smooth it out um, and sometimes they do stiffen up and I have to uh, make them a little bit uh, more, not liquid, but not so dry. So what I do is I use gum solution uh, from Amico. You put the directions are on here. You put a tablespoon in like a pint of water, something like that. I put it in a squeeze bottle like this so that I can just squeeze it onto here so that these areas that are got have gotten a little bit dry, I can just come in here, I'll add a little bit of liquid and I can mix it in. This is good also for if you have glazes that have dried out to put gum solution in it. I used to just add water, especially when I taught high school because you know, a student would need something and I'd run over there and it was too thick. And I'm like, whatever, I'm just gonna put some water in there. Uh, but what happens is this is actually a suspension agent and it will keep everything in suspension much, much better for you. So that's the deal on gum solution. What I like to use over my printing is two different Amico glazes. One is Teacher's Palette Light. It's a low fire translucent glaze. I sometimes mix it also with a clear glaze if I want it real translucent and just a hint of color. But you can see, I love that they did these labels this way where you can actually see the color. And these glazes do what potters call break and pool. They break on the high points and pool in the low point. So you get this nice variation of color and they are OMG beautiful overlapped with each other because it's like painting on sheer layers of color but this is my go one of my go-to's when I do printing on clay because I want to see the print but I want it to have a, a pop of color if I'm working cone six five six in there I use the the celadons they also have a mixing clear so if I want it super just a hint of blue I might even mix it 50 50 there are uh, glaze charts online with Amico where they mix different ones together and they even mix some of them with the PCs. I don't usually do that because my goal is to have it so that I can see what I've printed on the clay. So those are my two go-to glazes. Okay, so let's move, do a little rearranging here. Uh, these are just the little jars of velvet under glazes. You know, they sell them kind of by the, I think they have it come a dozen to a case. And these are really good if you're really not sure what you want to do. Um, these, I just left the lids off. Uh, it doesn't work for a pint like this. You have to give it more surface area to evaporate. But these little jars, sometimes I'll just leave them like that if I wanna test out some new colors and uh, that, that works pretty good, but they do have to be pretty stiff. Once they've gotten stiff, then I put them in a jar like this and I use a palette knife to get it, to, to use it on whatever it is I'm doing. So this is an eight ounce jar that I'm showing you here. I just bought it from the hobby store and this is the pint. So if I use this and evaporate it off, I get eight ounces of printing ink. Now, at first I thought I was getting like a little gypped, only have eight ounces. However, it's so concentrated and there's much less liquid in it that it really, you know, when you do printing, like if you do linoleum prints, softy cut prints, anything like that, styrofoam prints, mono prints, whatever you're doing on printmaking, you can now use the exact same materials, brayers, barons, everything. You just won't be using ink on paper. You'll be using underglaze ink on clay. I work flat. I like to work flat on to a slab of clay. So let me show you some of the, the silk screens that I'm gonna do with you today. Let me save that one for later. So I go and I buy um, this sports flex. And Diane, is this upside down to you or right side up? 
It's upside down. There. How about go. that? Is that better? Okay. Perfect. Um, this is an iron-on vinyl. You get it at any hobby store. Huh? Oh. Kevin was saying you, he could flip the whole picture so that you wouldn't have to hold it upside down. We could. Her, she'll be upside down. Oh. Oh, he says we don't no. want that hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so this is an iron on transfer paper. It's um, basically a piece of heat sensitive vinyl that's adhered to a piece of clear plastic. And basically what people do is they cut these shapes and they use an iron and they iron it onto their clothes. But this is what I've been doing. I take... Um, a piece of organza fabric, very, it's very thin. It looks like this, it's like silkscreen fabric. And I buy this at Joann's Fabrics, so cheap, especially with a coupon. And this is my silkscreen material. So somebody earlier today emailed me about the mesh size I use. I haven't ordered silkscreen fabric in so long. I really don't know what I would use. It'd take a little research. But this organza, it works really so good. So what I do is I take the organza and I'm basically going to fuse shapes onto there. So sometimes I'll cut them out with, I have a Silhouette Cameo die cut machine. A lot of times I'll use that. Um, you can also freehand cut it. So it looks like, so this is one that I cut on my die cut machine. Okay. You know, you lay things in a special place so you can find them when you get on the camera. And hello, what happens? <laughs> okay. So, do you have any do you have any questions on there yet? While I'm looking for where my little thing is, we uh, had a question actually asking if you could tint mixing clear with the velvet underglaze, like if you had the Amico mixing clear. Could you tint um, it with underglazes? I would tend well, to think not. Well, I do have to say this. I have to kind of a little bit of a confession right here to the entire world. Um, I have, there is so much stain in velvet underglazes that I use it to color my slips. I've even used it to color a clear glaze. Would I suggest I'm, it? Yeah. No, but you know, I, I have done it just because. The underglaze. I yeah, I, I've used it to color slips, but never the clear glaze. But I don't know, you could test, right? Test, test, yep. test. Yes, I, I, I mix everything, I, yes. Okay, so here I've die cut this, I cut on this side, this is the vinyl side, and it has this clear plastic piece. And after you cut it, you can cut it with a die cut machine, but you can also just cut it with an X-Acto knife. I just did this because I was kind of in a rush getting everything prepared. Then your next step is to peel that off. This is the part that's going to print. And of course, this is the part that's going to mask. So then what you're going to do is you are going to take a piece of parchment paper like you cook with. You're going to put your fabric. Here it is. It's so sheer. You're going to put your fabric and you're going to put this with the vinyl side down toward the fabric and another piece of parchment on top. It's that parchment that you cook with. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna go in here with a hot iron, hot dry iron, and you don't wanna really kind of scrub it around, not that that matters, but the whole idea is trying to get it to heat transfer. So I really push, I count to five or 10, I move, I push, count to five or 10, la, 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 like that. Okay, then when I take it out and through the magic of the internet, oh, look, this is all fused already. Okay, then what you do is you peel off the plastic and you trash that. And then I give it a second ironing. I put a, the fabric back here and then I just make sure it's heat set because I don't want it creeping up a little bit. Not that it usually does, but that's just kind of a little guarantee. Then it's pretty, it's pretty flimsy. Like 
it's great because it's flexible. You can put it around a pot on a potter's wheel. So it's pretty flexible. And I do like that, but it's almost a little too flexible. So what we're going to do is basically go in here and now you can trim off your extra organza. I've even stretched organza on screens and stuff. I'm like, love it because it's like budget friendly. Then I take my, I'm not going to tape it all the way around for you, but just so you kind of see how. So what I do is I go around here and I add some tape all the way around and I trim it. This acts as a frame, like a wooden frame around a silk screen. That's what this does. So this one has already been taped and done. So now let me show you how they print because they, excuse me, are fabulous. Okay, so I am going to, I always use, um, I use a lot of plastic when I use the, I work a lot on slabs and I'm just gonna put a little plastic on the underside of this. And the road, only reason is I don't want it to, I'm working on a piece of drywall board and I don't want it to continually dry out. Although I'm not gonna be going that super fast. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is this is one that I've been loving lately. It's like ridiculously simple, it's a circle. I mean, you could just cut any shape out of it. And this is what I like about it. I'm gonna take, I, I really like printing with dark colors and I love the white underglaze. I find that um, if I use uh, yellows and light colors, they're very translucent. And I like the opaque light and the opaque look and also um, the white is opacified. So you're not gonna get any kind of transparency. So what I like about this, applying the underglazes this way is I like using a paintbrush. I don't use a squeegee. I use either a paintbrush or a sponge. And I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna flip this the other way, this way, because remember this is the vinyl and there's really not a little ledge there but I really wanna use this side that's all fabric so I can scoot right across there. So we'll put that on. We'll take some of this blue, this teal blue, one of my favorites. Go around here and then my white gets kind of dirty cause I'm always adding, you know, using it for everything. I used to never use white underglaze. Now I'm like, I use it all the darn time. Then when you lift it up, you have this totally even super graphic surface. So you can also then take these other shapes and I really like combining the shapes. And I also like, um, like I said, I like mixing the colors if we can put a little purple in here. Now, you'll notice, look at what I did. I flipped this kind of the wrong way. It's pink side up, but it'll still work. So we're gonna just ignore that. And you get these super, super crisp, really crisp looks. So let's do this one with a little dark green so you can kind of see that a little better. Now that green's gonna not be the prettiest with that purple, but you know, there you have it. And you have these, gro these great prints. Now, see that kind of dirty area? Look at that. Oh, no. This is how you deal with that. When you're, I love overlapping images. So when I overlap, see what happened? I got a, a print on the back of that from that oval. I just, when I overlapped it. So what you do is you just take a little paper towel or I don't use a sponge because I don't want to add water to my um, silk screen because you don't want the liquid creeping out. So what I do is I go in here, I just wipe that off. I'm gonna moisten it just a little bit. You just don't wanna flood it with water, but you just wipe that off while, while you're printing. So now 
I can do it and I won't get these kind of repeat prints over and over. So let me show you one that I've done. So this one, I just um, I did the same way. And what I like about it, I had the best question one time when I was doing this. A woman said, why don't you just cut a stencil? Like, why don't you take stencil paper and just cut a sphere? The reason that I don't is because you have fabric. You've got this fabric in here. When you do these big shapes and you blend these colors, what happens is it eat that fabric evens out all the underglaze. And, you know, when you paint with underglazes, getting crisp graphic edges are like, are you kidding me? Forget it. This way you can get those really graphic, clean edges on shapes or stripes or whatever it is you're going to do. Okay, so let's look at a couple of other variations. So may I ask a question? Some folks I would want love to know that. Yeah. If that is the same organza you get with those little organza bags. I have no idea. All I know is I get it from Joanne's Fabrics. So just the, organza from Joanne's Fabrics. Okay. Yeah, it's um I if they get if they really want the actual number, it's in the bridal department and it's a very very common easy to find at any fabric store material. The organza bags probably are if you wanted to cut them apart and use them, but organza is like a few bucks a yard. I mean, and you can get like a quarter yard and you'll be silk screening like crazy for a long time. And then another quick question, are they easy to clean the silk screens you're making? Oh, yes. I, I just uh, like this one, I just now wiped off, but I've, I've been washing these over and over because you got to remember this irons on fabric t-shirts that people wash in the washing machine. I wash them. I have a clothesline here in my studio and I just hang them on the clothesline and they work great and they dry really, really quickly. Fantastic. So this is another way that I do it be, because um, some people don't like to, to cut shapes. So on this one, what I did is I, I just took a sheet of the vinyl. I cut it into shapes. I set the shapes on the organza and ironed it. And what I liked about doing this is that I could move all the parts and move them all around to get what I wanted. And then I iron it and it locks it in place and I just peel off the acrylic. The thing that's tricky with this one is you have to remember that this is the part that's gonna print, not these shapes. So it's gonna be this, the outside area that's going to print. So just gotta keep that in mind. I've also used this which is, this is just a regular vinyl. I just bought it. It's also for those Cameo Silhouette Cricut machines. It's in that department. It's a stick-on vinyl. I did cut it on the um, that die cut machine, but I've also cut them by hand. I just did these and I love this like, you know, positive and negative thing where you take it from one and put it to another. I have washed these many times and the edges are still stuck. I didn't have to use an iron. I mean, just for even stripes, it would be stunning for not even an, if you weren't doing an image. This is a crazy one. This is, um, I was pricing pottery and I was putting these little stickers, price stickers on things. And this is the grid that's left. And I stuck it and this, now it's gotten a little wonky, but I've washed this doggone thing and it prints like, it, it's shocking how good it prints. I'll show you. I think I put a sample over here somewhere. And last but not least, if you want to go the lowest tech that you've ever seen, this is white glue on organza. You put white glue, you just draw on it, you let it dry, you print with it, and you can, this has already been washed. And you can see that the white glue is still there. They won't last forever, but hey, whatever. Okay, so now there are two kinds of prints that you can do. And um, I, I talked about this this morning. There are what I call direct prints, which is what I just did. And there's indirect prints where you print on newsprint. 
So what I did on here is I took a piece of newsprint. Let me grab a piece and I'll show you. So this, I grabbed, I grabbed the newsprint and I, uh, and I'm good, at, and I use these stencils to print on here. Now, some print on newsprint better than others because they they tend to slip around a little bit. So you do have to watch it. But I was really shocked at really how well these things did print. So this is how I did these, and then I'm going to show you how kind of a final product. I really like these paintbrushes. They're a synthetic. I think Michael Harbridge probably has some of these. They're they're really a. It's kind of a synthetic bristle. I've got a, but unfortunately, I've even used it so much I've worn off the handle. So I don't know who makes it, but it's probably one of his. It's kind of a stiff bristle th synthetic brush, and I find it works good. I don't like using a stenciling brush or anything like that. I don't find that works so well. So now I'm going to go ahead and flip this this way. I think that'll work better. Hopefully you can see it. And again, you can just combine your colors. I've even been doing some quilting and doing the same thing on the fabric. And I think my quilts are looking like pots and my pots are looking like softer, <laughs> like fabric. But you can see how gra how beautifully it prints on that newsprint. And I really like being able to mix the colors right on the spot. I don't like, you know, cleaning everything up and switching to another color. I work a lot with analogous colors, but really, they really show up when you put them on here. So this is on newsprint. So what I did is on this one, I did three different layers. And just like we did this morning, uh, we talked about this. When you print on paper and you transfer it, uh, number one, I don't like to do a lot of writing or text because it's in reverse and that confuses me. But whatever you print first is in the foreground of your print and whatever you finish with like these parts right here will be the background. This was done with that one screen, this silly little screen that I stuck painter's tape to. And I've washed this one over and over shockingly well. And I put it painter's set tape side down. And of course you can't really traditionally silk screen. So I took a sponge and just kind of did a little bit here and there. So I layered up three different images. Then what you're going to do is we're going to transfer this to the clay with casting slip. And this is again, a little repeat of what we did this morning because why? Because I love it and it's fabulous. So I'm going to take Amico casting slip. This is the cone five, cone five. They can make a low fire and a high fire. This is the high fire one. The low fire works tremendous too, but it's a gray in color because I think it's probably got a lot of ball play in it. It's gray in color and it fires really white. And so does this one. But I love the color of this in the raw form as I'm trying to figure out what colors I want to use. Let me make sure I'm on the screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to coat this with this casting slip to transfer the print to a sheet of clay. What's the advantage? Why, why not just print right on the clay? Why in the world would you want to do this? Well, I like it because I like doing it sometimes because I can spend all day print, 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 print. I have a hard time when I first started doing clay of organizing my time. This way I can spend a whole day just concentrating on printing hang them up around my studio and say, what kind of pots do I wanna make out of that kind of print? And again, like I said, I work a lot with slabs. Now, I've covered this over with the casting slip and because I use casting slip and because casting slip contains much less water than a traditional slip, it takes five to 10 minutes to, to dry up. What am I looking for? I'm looking for when I pick it up and look across it, I wanna see that there are no puddles, no shiny areas, 
that it looks like a sheet of leather, AKA, you know, like leather hard clay. So you want it to get basically leather hard. And I've even colored this, like this is white, but if I really wanted to have a background color of a blue, I would just mix a little bit of this in my casting slip and paint it on and it makes it a blue slip. I, I use casting slip all the time. I love it. It's smooth. It's done. It's there. It's great. Okay. So when this firms up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, it's not quite ready, but what I'll do is I'll pick it up and then I'll lay it this side down on a piece of, on a slab of clay and a voila. We have that. Yes, we do. Oh, look, there it is. Then we're going to take, what you want to do is to take a rib or a squeegee or something, and you really want to get it onto that surface. But I can tell you, the thing I love about printmaking, and I hated printmaking when I was in undergraduate school, because uh, it was kind of so picky uni. But what I do like about printing is you get this kind of irregular things happening and that's okay. So now whatever you had now will transfer onto the clay and you just pull it back real slowly. And then if you have any problem areas, you can just lay it back down, squeeze it over. Also, if you if it gets kind of dry, let's say you got a phone call and you had to leave it, and then now you come back and there's dry patches, you just moisten it a little with a little with a sponge, and it'll it'll work just fine. <clears throat> Let me pull that back because it was tearing. So now. That's a little hard to see because the values are so much the same. So if I was going to, if I was going to, you know, work on, I'd work on this some more. Like I would now silk screen right on this. If I don't get what I want, then I'll come in here and I will add, I will add something else to it, which I think I'll do right now. Do you have a question for me? Oh my gosh, so many. So where do you get your <laughs> newsprint? What mill is it? <laughs> okay, I get my newsprint from the packing department at Home Depot. That's what I work on. But the ones that I print on is Strathmore 300 series newsprint. Okay. But you would you do want to use kind of a good quality newsprint. But if you're a teacher, I'd use whatever you have in your classroom would work. <laughs> Good. So um, you are using the Amico High Fire Casting Slip. So can you use the uh, Amico porcelain, ca porcelain Casting Slip on any five six stoneware? So we well, can use this it. Well, this does clip? say num This does say number one porcelain slip. Number I one find porcelain it, slip. Yeah, I find that it's not a translucent porcelain slip. It's just a kind of a white slip. Frankly, I think any kind of a deflocculated or casting slip will do because the benefit is this. When I first started doing this, this I was watching a video and the guy says, well, now that I've covered it with a slip, I'm going to go watch Netflix and let it dry. I'm like, who are you and where do you are you kidding me? <laughs> now, so this is usually what I do, like if I don't get what I want. I'll sponge areas off, I'll add more prints on, I'll go in and draw in it so it's more like scraffito, things like that. What other kind of questions do you have for me? So do you need to use the casting slip or can you put the transfer directly on bisque clay and apply a damp sponge to the back? That's a great question, no. Underglaze transfer. Probably not because, not definitely not with the organza. I did, I did it because I had that question uh, during one of my other presentations. So I said, hmm, I'll try it. But when I put the organs on the bisque tile and did it over with the sponge, the bisque is so thirsty and there's so little water content in your inks. You know, it, these work better uh, on bisque if they're more liquid. Well, you've already taken the water out. So to me, I didn't like the effect. It, I had a real struggle with it and I, it didn't work so well for me. Thank you. And so could we use rice paper instead of newsprint? 
I have tried rice paper and um, I can't remember how it worked out, but I did try it because I was trying to make like, you know how they have those commercial ones that you can buy that they silk screen onto a rice paper and they transfer, they sell them at in seek and places. Um, I, I tried to mimic that, it, it didn't work so well. And then we had a couple questions about, they don't understand why you need the casting slip, like why we have to put this, the casting okay. slip on. Okay, all right. This is gonna be more than you're gonna wanna know, but here we have <laughs> it, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna switch over so I'm looking at your faces instead of just my hands and then I'll switch back. Okay, this is what casting slip is. Casting slip is a deflocculated slip. When you make a slip, you add clay, and you add water and then you mix it up and you've got your slip and you're ready to go. Well, a deflocculated slip that they use in molds is deflocculated because they don't want as much water in that slip. So what they do is when they add a deflocculant in, it creates an electrical charge between the particles and they're so busy knocking against each other. I mean, it's a party in that jar. They're so busy knocking against each other, they never flock together and sink. That's why like when you look at a bucket that has water and clay in it, the water's at the top and the clay's at the bottom because they've glommed together, got heavy and they sunk. When you get casting slip, it's always in suspension and it doesn't have as much water. That's why they use it in molds. They pour it into a uh, plaster mold. They let it sit for a few minutes. They turn it upside down and pour the rest out so that there's just a shell in there, like those chocolate Easter bunnies that you eat. Because it has less water, it's less to evaporate. So you, it's, it dries so fast. And I use it on, I use it a lot because of that fact. But for the transfers, if I use a regular slip, I'll wait 45 minutes to transfer. If I use a casting slip, I wait eight minutes to transfer. So it's a big difference. More than you probably want to know, but there you got it, baby. They asked, they get it. You get I, I <laughs> um, in my slip casting class too. And so I explain it's like cheap, they deflock. <laughs> They don't flock, they go away. It's a, so, it's a uh, party in that jaw. It, there sure is. So what kind of foam is on the GR pottery forms? I know you talked about it earlier, but the folks in this oh, one, this okay. podcast might not have seen that. And they want to know. Is, is. This is, uh, again, Joanne's fabric. It's a Pellon in, where the inner facings are. It's really, I think, a headliner for a car where, you know, when you feel the top of your car, that's what it is. But it, it's a foam. It doesn't have any stickiness to it. I glue it onto my forms because I don't want an edge. I want this. Now, this is just greenware. I haven't fired it or anything. Um, and I really like just not having that hard edge. So I take it and I've got, oh my gosh, I have kept this boy in business. Holy cow. I must have, I don't know how many of these things. I use them all the time time. They are great. And since we have a couple of minutes, I'm going to do this while I'm answering questions. And I'm going to show you how I do this. I've taken my slab and I've encased, I have it, I always leave it encased in plastic on the top and on the bottom. And um, one of the ways that I cut this is a pizza cutter, because I want this like nice edge. And I'm going to cut this about a half inch bigger than my form. And I'm ready for any more questions too, so. So can you remove the pellon then to use the GR pottery form as a stack? So if you have the stacking forms and you stick you know, the uh, foam on and then you decide later, no, I wanna stack them together. Well, you can always rip it off for sure. Right, but I mean, you might destroy the foam and have to redo it, but. Oh yeah, the foam will be trash, but could you do it? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I just have it tacked on with like one or two dots of glue. So I'm, I'm glad you're making something. We had a few people ask, they can't see the end result in their head. They have a hard time picturing this in like a vertical form, how that would work out. So yeah, this is, and this, this is good. Okay. So these are, this is a vertical form. So this is a cup. 
And I use my most favorite, it really expensive template McDonald's <laughs> coffee cup that I cut up and make a template. So as long as you leave the plastic on while you're forming, you're fine. So this one is also just kind of a little sample one that I was working on. It's just a cylinder that I attached a bottom to. And then the more Pellon questions. How thick is the Pellon? Yeah, it only comes in one thickness. It's a quarter inch, That's I think. It. Yeah, so, you'll see it if you go inch. if you go to a fabric store and you go to the, where the inner facings are. Uh, that's where you'll find it. And I usually I use I really like encasing this clay in um, plastic because what I like to do is I like to spend all day printing on clay. And then I don't, I can't print and make, it's too much. So I, I print on clay and I, I might cut them into their shapes or leave them in the plastic. I can leave them in plastic like this for a week and come back to it. So I just print and stack and I stack them up. Now, I don't wanna mess up this surface. So one thing that I do like to do is I do like to sometimes add, because I'm using the, the teacher's palette light or the celadons that look great in texture. I do like to put a roller stamp on the back. Sometimes I leave the plastic in place because if my clay is wet, it keeps my stamps from sticking and I still get that great textured look. So we'll do that. Now I'm gonna take, I can take this off. Now you could leave this on or take it off. It's a very faint on here. It's probably hard to see. So you could now, you could do it now if you wanted to, but I'm gonna leave this on the surface. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, I usually prop these up on a jar, wham, wham, in case I'm a little bit over the edge. And I'm gonna put this on here. And I kind of feel up under here and then and and Jeff told me, Mr. GR Pottery Forms, I was having a little warpage issue. And he said, Well, do you leave them on the forms? And that's what I do now. Because the plastic is underneath here, if it shrinks and pulls this way, it's gonna slide because there's plastic on there. Okay. Now I leave this overnight. And when I come back, we're gonna see if it'll hold together enough. When I come back, I just lift out my form. Oh, look at that darn cute dish. And then when I'm done at the end, I just remove the plastic. <sighs> we loving some under glazes now. So I just oh. wanna quickly um, add in, if folks wanna reach you, Kathy, for any questions about this process, either this morning's or this afternoon's, uh, tutorial, it's Cleopatra, Cleopatra. Yes. It used to be Cleo, it used to be Cleopatra, Queen of Denial, but I did shorten oh, it. Oh, you shortened it. <laughs> so please feel free to reach out to Kathy. Um, you know, we can only cover so much during these broadcasts. So, so there's so much information. So we packed got it we in. If they're coming, we're packing it in. We've got about 30 seconds left. So any, uh, but he has any last minute questions, we'll try to get them out there. Um, if you have any last things you want to leave everybody with before we know all I've got, all I've got to say is if you're living the right kind of life, you go get you some Amico velvet under glazes because they are the right kind fabulous. Go <laughs> live your best life. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> all right. Well, Kathy, all right. thank you so much. And Diana the woman behind the scenes who's been answering all the questions on Facebook and everything. Thank you so much for joining us for this tutorial has been really great. Uh, you know, today's been fun with these printmaking ideas. I know a lot of folks never thought about printmaking or always wanted to try it and thought it was too high tech or too difficult or they needed a lot of supplies. And I think Kathy has shown us that just being able to go to Joanne Fabrics and you can find pretty much everything you need to do some low tech um, printmaking techniques on pottery. All right, so 
Whew, I hope you guys have a notebook and I hope you're keeping track of all the things that you're learning because there's so much that's already happened and so much more to come in ClayShareCon. So we're gonna take a quick break and set up for our next tutorial and that is with Mr. GR Pottery Forums himself. Jeff is going to join us. Yay! We're all excited for Jeff and he's going to be giving you some GR Pottery Forum basics. So if you have questions or if you've had any issues with the GR Pottery Forums, you know, I love Kathy sharing that, that Pelon to help get a nice softer transition. So maybe we'll talk about that. I don't know. You'll have to come back and see. Catch y'all in a little while. <laughs>